an office building, you're in your pajamas, in your bed, underneath your covers, looking away at something. It's completely different. And for that reason, I think the court should look at this completely different. But wait a minute, though. It's completely different. It's easier, isn't it? You're that's, sitting there, you have... The <clears throat> no, you have all the time in the world. You could look at it. You choose not to look at it. And, and frankly, there's more than one supplier for whatever the product that you're buying online in all likelihood. But you found the cheapest and you found one that's going to give you free shipping or whatever it is. And so you're making a decision to <clears throat> forego some of the protections, perhaps for cost or convenience. Well, part of that is, from the standpoint of the seller, we need a little predictability as well. When you execute a will, you have sort of the protective function of, of the whole process of executing it. And um, like you were saying, that just isn't there. Yeah, when you're completing an online transaction. It's well, what, what do you mean it isn't there? It isn't there because you choose not to, 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 to take advantage of it, right? It's, it's all there. No, no it's I, think it's 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 not I think this is a recognized a niche, and, and, and the way society is going, and they're exploiting it as far as they can go, because in a way... But that's what you guys do, right? You're the lawyers. You're the ones that encourage that exploitation. You're the ones that encourage, tell your clients, well, this is what you can do now, right? That's, it's... It's not the businesses didn't come up with this on their own. They came up with it with, with advice from people schooled in the law who say, why wouldn't you do this? Yeah, no, it's going that way. Just people don't get to get. You'd think with, with online people would get together more, but in fact, people get together less. Agreed. And I mean, in a smaller town 50 years ago, people would say, hey, we're not buying that anymore. But that just doesn't, it just doesn't happen, you know, and, it, and it's not likely to happen unless something really egregious happens. And they're going to exploit this as far as they can take it because... But it is kind of like you really can't get this stuff. Or, you but know, you can. Sure you can go to a store, but there's not many options anymore. You don't see a lot of mom and pop stores, and I mean, they're. My guess is stuff. there are more mom and pop stores on the internet than probably at any time in our history. There's a lot of big stores too, but but you could find a product in multiple places. We we can say, well, no, this is the only place, but it but it isn't anymore, right? I mean, we're not limited to have to just walk downtown and find the store that has it. And. You get a reading. Coupon for cereal. Okay, listen. That's that. That to me, this is this is the 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 article presents a completely different problem because I think I really don't think that was reasonable to expect that that they're going to bind me to to provisions that the New York Times article talks about when there wasn't even a purchase. What what I'm talking about with Mark and and with these clauses in general is. If you're making a purchase and you're choosing not to read the contract, and, and I, I will readily admit, virtually every major online store is going to have similar provisions. Some, they'll be similar, though. There, may be, there will be variations. But they, they won't favor the consumer. And the fact is, the law, as you can see from these cases, does not favor the consumer. They favor, this was Mark shouted us off here, why, why does the courts favor it? Is it because they, they're lazy and want fewer cases to decide? I think in part. Uh, but I also think they see that this, the law is what it is, is that, you know, it's, it's an old uh, uh, Latin axiom, ignorantia lex non excusa, right? Ignorance of the law is no excuse. If you choose to be ignorant of the facts of the law and you say, I accept, I have a hard time on a personal responsibility basis excusing you now from your sloth. And, and I do it, but I recognize I'm giving up my rights. And how, how, how is that not fair? Just simply because, well, they're all doing it, and they know we're lazy and we're not going to read it? But doesn't these clauses point out like a bigger problem that these companies know that they're making crappy products and things are going to go bad? So to fix the problem, we need a way to make sure that when people sue us, we don't pay anything. Well, you realize they would put the fault, they would not paint it that way. They would say, we're making, no, no, really, right? We're making really good products. But these thieving bastard lawyers are making our ability to continue to do business virtually impossible. And, you know, they're making mountains out of molehills. Uh, I think the article also mentioned, you know, natural ingredients when they're not all natural. Well, God made everything at some point. At least I'm sure there would be their argument. So it's no matter what we call it natural. But they would 
not put the blame in-house, they would put the blame on you guys drumming up these class actions for relatively modest amounts for relatively minor violations. So they would see it as good products, but it's the thieving lawyers again. And so what they're trying to do is use other lawyers to protect themselves against you. Other thieving lawyers. Other thieving <laughs> lawyers, as, the, as they would see it. Um, it let, let me ask you, okay, I understand, and I do understand your perspective from the consumer standpoint. If you guys represented businesses, are you saying, well, we wouldn't do this then? We would not advise our businesses, our dentists, our coffee companies, our... Um... Oh, right now I'm a consumer. No, no, but, 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 but you, I heard, and, and legitimately, and I, I'm sympathetic to it, you're worried about the exploitation of, uh, of this area of the law. Um, so you wouldn't encourage your clients to do it if they were looking for ways to limit liability. Oh, you would, but... Jump on that bandwagon. No, definitely, but it's creative. It's new. What? And Why not, right? It is creative, and it is... Um, I don't know whether... I don't, it'd be interesting to see where this will end up as to, <clears throat> what, to what extent it's enforceable. The problem is it takes advantage of what the court's natural interest in as well. Fewer cases... In the, as they would see it, more important cases, more substantial cases, and getting rid of some of these other ones that clog up the courts as they see it without any real benefit. Of course, as everyone points out, well, if they're making dangerous or crappy products and people are getting hurt by it, that hardly is something that the court shouldn't have some interest in, in assisting with resolving and stopping the dangerous products. It's going to uh, end up, though, just like everything else on this planet, someone's going to take it too far and they're just going to get rid of it completely eventually. I mean, that's See, most I, likely what happens always. I, I, I think there'll be areas, and I think the personal injury area, as this points out, at least some of the uh, people speaking point out, becomes problematic. But I'm not so sure they're going to go backwards with respect to this. I think the, because of the, the method of e-commerce at this point, you've got questions about where, and it could be virtually anywhere in the world, suit could be brought, um, who bears some of the, the risks on the, the transport and everything else, uh, or for the transaction itself. Um, and, and the fact is, is that they want some predictability to it. They don't want to have all of these disputes clogging the courts. Uh, I'm afraid that it's not going to go the route you like. I, I worry, because why not try it, that you're going to find, you, as, as you guys were starting to point out, there may be no merchant that I can do business with that doesn't have a clause like this in some capacity that's going to limit the consumers or even other businesses' abilities to, to what we would normally think of as due process, the right to have uh, a, a matter heard in court in a court of some level of convenience to them. And the fact is, is that there's no reason why a business wouldn't put these clauses in now even if it's not overtly to discourage litigation, at least in part, it certainly is going to. Let's talk about this Francis case, and then we'll do those questions that you've got. Um, I thought there's a couple important things that I wanted you to think about here in this declaratory judgment case, um, and I want to point out to you as well so as you start to think about it. We've got a multi-count complaint, which is not uncommon, again, in Massachusetts. One of the counts being 93A, which we looked at earlier in the semester as well. Um, and that's the uh, uh, business fraud, consumer fraud situation where we're looking at uh, recovering for unfair and deceptive trade practices. The reason we usually include a clause along those, uh, one of the counts in there is that that would provide attorney's fees as well as uh, a multiple uh, damage award for any damages that are awarded that are found to be in violation 93A. So it's quite common if there's a credible claim um, that we put such a count in. And you also have the declaratory judgment uh, in count six that they're re uh, requesting, uh, requiring restoration at defendant's expense um, of another means of egress from the uh, LaGrange Street location. Um, it was a six-day jury waived trial, um, and again, some of the counts, for, such as declaratory judgment 93A, you wouldn't have been entitled to a jury trial, uh, but on other counts for straight negligence and the like, you would have, but at, at any rate, the parties waived the jury trial. 
Um, but I also thought footnote two was important, and I just want to point this out. It says, the court, with the consent of the parties, took direct exam by affidavit. Closing arguments took place October 31st. Um, that is obviously an odd procedure in, in, in conducting a trial. Uh, but the fact is that many agencies, if you try cases before agencies, uh, what they do oftentimes is ask that the direct testimony be pre-filed. In, in essence, all we're doing is putting in what the witness would say in a narrative fashion. And then the trial time is actually reserved simply for cross-examination, like in this case. It sounds odd. It is a slightly odd. Uh, but, you know, a direct exam, for the most part, has been rehearsed and anticipated, and you should be able to put a direct exam in without much difficulty. And so the fact is, is that if we have that direct testimony in advance, either by way of affidavit or what we call pre-filed testimony from, with agencies, then we have some time to look at it and then construct a cross-examination. There is some suggestion that it's a more effective way to then proceed. The first time you do it, it seems enormously odd because, in essence, then the advocates are writing the testimony. Obviously, since it's going to be subject to cross, uh, you better make sure that the witness is going to stand up to cross so you can't be putting uh, words in there that the witness isn't going to understand or the witness won't support. And the fact is, like an affidavit, the witness has to sign off on it and say that it's true under the pains and penalties of perjury at any rate. <coughs> so you have to be careful not to over-advocate the piece. But at the same point, you do have an ability to construct your direct testimony uh, in a way that most of us don't when, we, when we're trying the case from a regular standpoint. So here the court took all the direct testimony by way of affidavit and then uh, brought the witnesses forward for cross-examination. And based on that, then, since it's a jury waived trial, the court has to make under Rule 52, and we've seen this before, findings of fact and conclusions of law. And, and all findings of fact are is precisely what this is as you see it. It lays out the facts that the court found from the testimony that was provided. A lot of times, um, if there was a, uh, a transcript and a record, that the findings of fact would also contain record references. In essence, you know, TR, transcript, at such and such a page, whatever the lines are. The reason for that is, is then <coughs> one can look at and see precisely where these facts, in, in fact, exist in the record. Uh, because they should exist in the record, the evidence should have been received on that. And so all the court does here is really lay out what the court establishes the findings, the facts to be from the testimony that was provided. And then based on the findings of fact that are contained in the whole first section of the decision, at some point then the court has to go to what the law is based on these facts. So the court has 69 uh, findings of fact as to what the uh, situation is, what the facts on uh, concerning the, the plaintiff's case is, and on that basis then the court has to establish conclusions of law, which is based on what I find the facts to be, this is how the law applies to the situation. Um, in conclusions of law, the parties would have provided the court with proposed conclusions of law, and then at some point what happens here is the court decides which ones to adopt and which ones uh, to reject and ultimately establishes its own conclusions of law as to what it says the law is <coughs> as, as uh, applied to the facts that it found through the course of the trial. Um, and then based on the findings of fact and based on the conclusions of law, the court then issues an order of judgment determining uh, who wins and why. Uh, and here, if you, uh, as you look at it, uh, the court did in fact issue this declar uh, declaratory judgment uh, ordering that, that um, a second means of egress be reestablished uh, when they took it out. He also makes other findings on the other counts with respect to both awarding attorney's fees um, and who should obtain judgment under what circumstances, uh, and the court um, at that point has issued a decision on the entire case. And so this would be pretty typical of a superior court judgment 
on uh, a case where it's jury waived and findings of fact and conclusions of law are filed by the court. Uh, and then at some point, obviously, this would be reduced further to some form of judgment as well um, in, a, in a separate uh, document as required under Rule 58. But that will have to be established after the court determines how much the uh, attorney's fees are uh, with respect to the claim uh, that they're awarding attorney's fees on as well. Questions on Francis versus Horowitz? Again, the modern approach is if you're going to seek a declaratory judgment, it is usually coupled with other counts within the complaint so that as by the time you're done then, you have the ability to have a decision that adjudicates the entire controversy. Let's take a look at these questions that we uh, I gave out at the start and gave you some time to look over. Um, obviously, we're approaching the end of the semester, end of the uh, course, and I think it's important to, to look a little harder uh, and think a little more about some of the issues. Uh, certainly, uh, these deal with uh, injunctive relief and the like. Um, so I wanted to you to think about it. We posted these. Uh, we posted the articles from the Times earlier online. We posted these questions as well, uh, and so I think they're worth taking a look at. So your first one is uh, question number 82. By the way, I took them out of this. Lexis Next, Nexus has a series of books for questions, um, and they're they're good enough. Uh, don't get crazy. I don't use multiple choice questions on the exam if that's. You look at it and say, oh, I didn't think he was going to do that. I'm not. Uh, but I do think sometimes they're interesting teaching tools. Even if especially, I think, part of the problem with remedies is where uh, equitable remedies talks about doing what's fair, what's just, what's right, uh, doesn't necessarily reduce itself to a nice, easy A, B, C, or D answer. Uh, and so if I've got a problem with some of the, you know, issue the injunction, the fact is, I can go before two different judges on the very same case with the very same argument and the very same opposition, and there is sufficient discretion that a lot of these calls are going to be so close that even if one judge says yes and another judge says no, doesn't mean that the judge who said yes was wrong or the one that said no was wrong. What it means is that they interpret the harm or they interpret the, the problem slightly differently, and as long as they apply the appropriate tests and do the correct analysis, um, it's not going to be reversed unless it's clearly erroneous, and that's a pretty significant uh, standard to have to account for. So uh, you can have some disagreement with what they say here, uh, and that's okay because equity, you need to know what the uh, analysis is and you need to know <coughs> what the framework for the test are, uh, but at the end of the day, uh, there's an awful lot of gray area uh, in equitable matters. Uh, so you read question 82. Um, they want to know, will the temporary injunction be granted? What do you like? Are there ones you can get rid of here? What about D? <coughs> no, because there's no denial of due process. <coughs> Is there a denial of due process? It was, wasn't he suspended without a hearing? Isn't that a denial of due process? Notice and the opportunity to be heard? No? So does he have to get here? Play a game? Yeah. <clears throat> He's losing something of value, isn't he? I crossed off C and D. You, Charlie crossed off C and D, and Will cross off C and D. Yeah, there is a denial of due process. Can I? But does he have to get a hearing to be suspended from a game? Doesn't he? That's what makes it due process, doesn't it? Juvenile? No. Huh? Is he a juvenile? That's not the high school he went to. Well, maybe, maybe, maybe he went to high school before the Constitution came into existence. Um, well, you okay? The fact that you didn't get one doesn't mean you shouldn't have gotten one. Um, and the fact is, due process is notice and an opportunity to be heard, right? Did this kid get this before he was? Uh, taken out of the game, the ability to play the game. No, there is a denial of due process. You may you want, may want to minimize it, but he does have some level of due process violation. Charlie says there is an imminent threat, there is an imminent threat of harm, 
the loss of being able to play the game. By the way, we saw some. We saw an injunction earlier on for the little girl who wanted to play Little League, um, where she went in, sought an injunction prohibiting them from denying her her equal protection rights to to not to be free of gender discrimination because she wanted to play with the boys. So you left with <coughs> you left with A and B. Charlie, what do you like? I, well, I think, too, the fact that they put that as a championship game, it kind of shows right away that there is a harm there. Yeah, it's so not. It's like I, I regular, agree with that. Regular average game. And it may be the last he ever plays. Yeah. You know, and, that's, and I think that's fair. That's a very, a very fair part of it. What do you like, A or B? A or B? B is a boy? I guess it's a B. You guess it's a B? Of course we're going to guess. But it is B. They say, they say the answer is B. Um, and I'll tell you why you could dis. First of all, a uh, you can. He doesn't have to get actual notice, right? You could get a TRO uh, that could be obtained without notice to the other side. So he doesn't need actual notice. And so by process of elimination, you're with B. Um, and frankly, since he doesn't need notice, you don't need to even provide him an effort to to give them notice. But the likelihood is the court is not going to simply. Um, order an injunction without any attempt to provide the other side notice. It doesn't have to be the formal notice we oftentimes think about. But I've gone over for injunctive relief and the court has said, did, did you call them? Do they know you're here? Uh, can you call them and see if they'll come over uh, within an hour? Um, you know, tell them we're going to be here. I'm going to wait till 3.30. Uh, it, when you know someone is represented, uh, the court is reluctant, even in, a, in an extraordinary situation, to allow someone to be blindsided, because they know what the, how the real world works. Whatever story I'm giving them, my client is giving them, and they're receiving through me, there's got to be other facts there. Uh, and the fact is, the world isn't all black, as I say it, or all white, as, as I might paint it. The fact is, is that I've got a version of the facts from the client, I've got some support for it, but there probably is another story. And especially when we're talking about trying to get an order without notice, the likelihood is the court is very concerned about uh, making sure that, that someone gets some minimal level of due process. doesn't need to be an extended period of time, but oftentimes the court's going to say, are they represented, and if they are, do they know you're here, or do they know what you're trying to do? And if I can say, yes, Your Honor, I told them I was coming today at 2, and they said, well, go do whatever you like, but we're not going to come, I'll make sure I provide that information to the court. Um, but the court oftentimes is going to attempt to make sure that there's some level of, of notice. Uh, so we can say a TRO can be issued without notice, and in an extraordinary situation it can be. Um, but uh, the court is still reluctant to do it. So I think the, the right answer 82 is B. 83. Um, <coughs> Sabrina is interested in taking legal action to stop Sleaze from violating her privacy, files a lawsuit against him, what type of injunctive relief is a court likely to award Sabrina at this stage of the litigation? Well, here's the thing, right? They, they assume that you're going to get some type of relief. <coughs> so, uh, based on that assumption, the question is, what's the best answer? Um, and, and I don't think you're going to get temporary relief, uh, because I think the temporary relief they talk about means an indication of a lack of notice to the other side. And there's no way you're going to get this type of order without um, um, <coughs> notice to the other side. I think uh, the fact is that before you're going to get a permanent relief, uh, you're going to need to be able to um, show that you've actually had success on the merits. There's no way they can do that as a preliminary matter. The case is going to have to be discovered and then there's going to have to go to trial in all likelihood or either trial or summary judgment before you're going to obtain a, uh, permanent relief. The type of injunctive relief that Sabrina is likely to get at this stage of the litigation, at this stage, would be a preliminary relief. She may be able to get permanent relief at the conclusion of the case, but she's not going to get it now. So 83, uh, I, would, I think C is in fact the correct answer. 84. City of Arcadia has been swamped. You read the question. Um, <clears throat> the Arcadian police would like to obtain a temporary restraining order to stop the protest scheduled for today 
And again, many of these, obviously, as you can see, or at least the last two are some free speech issues involved, which the court is always reluctant to grant injunctive relief um, with respect to um, speech. Uh, the police filed a complaint with the court. They make no attempts to contact the protesters prior to the ex-party hearing. Will the court issue the requested injunction? Um, and I think, well, what do you like? <coughs> What do you like in view of our conversation with question 82? Uh, they say the answer is not C. An actual notice to the defendant is not required. But again, you're looking to stifle free speech by way of an injunction. A free speech injunction is very, very difficult to get. The right answer, they say, is B, and I agree with that. Um, there is some level of harm. Um, ex party injunctions are authorized by the court, but again, any type of restraint on speech is, is suspect. And in order to get it, you better at least have provided some uh, opportunity for them to come in and challenge it. I think it's likely. I think the court would order that in the event you didn't, and then set it down for a permanent, uh, I'm sorry, preliminary injunction. But I think absent an effort to notify, the likelihood of getting this is uh, low. But, it, but again, we're asking to resolve questions by way of multiple choice that are not at their core made to be resolved this way. The court has discretion to act on it. Um, you do have damage to the town buildings and property, block traffic for miles. Um, you yeah, could get, huh? Yeah, Right, and you have, and you, and you have uh, violence. You know, the fact is, you, you might have a court that would be able to do it, and I think what you guys were picking under those circumstances were C, uh, or D. D, they're both actually very relatively close. Uh, actual notice isn't required, and ex party injunctions are authorized, and you do have potentially a very dangerous situation. So the authors of the, uh, uh, say, the right answer to 84 is B, but, but frankly, uh, in the real world, uh, you definitely could have a court issue it under C or D. The problem with this, though, is this is a relatively easy case to give notice to. You go down with the bullhorn, uh, seriously, and you say, we're going to be in court today at 2 o'clock seeking to uh, enjoin you from proceeding any further along these lines. Anyone who wants to be heard should be heard. Um, and again, we're not necessarily talking about formal notice to each individual protester. We're trying to give enough people some form of notice that the court knows that you're attempting to get a, um, uh, an order prohibiting their free speech. The problem is it's free speech. It's um, the violence and the rest of it, that's obviously does, shouldn't fall, doesn't fall within speech, but you are seeking to limit their right to assemble and protest, and, and that, that is, is looked at uh, very, very strictly by the court. You got 81. Uh, What's the difference between C and D, really? There really isn't. There really, I mean, it's really right. They're both. They're using. <laughs> they're both actually correct statements of the law. Um, there really is none, for all intents and purposes. And that's the problem with some of the the questions. Is uh, the questions pose interesting issues, but they don't lend themselves necessarily to good multiple choice answers. So the answers aren't always satisfactory, frankly. And it's not just for remedies, it's for it's, uh, all of the others. I like the series simply because they give us some talking, a uh, basis to jump off of talking points. But some of the questions and some of the answers are more than are, are suspect. Um, so you, you got 81, uh, a plaintiff class comprised of teacher students, parents, sues the state of utopia, claiming that the voucher program is unconstitutional request a preliminary injunction, what is the likely result of their request? And again, you know, you're trying to make a decision based on relatively limited information that is going to vary depending on what judge we go before. <coughs> what they say the right answer is, is D is in dog. And the reason they're saying it's D as in dog is that that would maintain the status quo 
during the pendency of the litigation. <coughs> um, Mine's cut off. What, what is the Granted because of the irreparable injury to the plaintiffs. Oh, D. Right. Am I out of order? Yeah, yeah. They, they were not printed off right, but you're all right. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's granted because of the irreparable injury. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Yep, I see what I did here. Okay. Granted because of the irreparable injury to, in, uh, to the plaintiffs is, that, is the balance of that answer. And what they're really saying there is we want to maintain the status quo during the pendency of the litigation. Uh, and we saw that in more than a few cases where the court, to, court tries to determine what the status quo is because there is a tendency in equitable cases to want to preserve the status quo during the two or three years that the case is pending. And the question had become in that case, and this was from the AU case, what is the status quo? And the court said the status quo was the last undisturbed place that the parties were in. And that's where we should try to maintain that relationship during the pendency of the litigation. Not the place immediately before filing suit, because that's likely a point of, uh, at that point, they are in disagreement. When was the last time? The status quo usually is looked at as the last undisturbed place where the parties were prior to the controversy. And the court is oftentimes in an equitable action likely to, in essence, maintain the status quo. Um, 85, we skipped over. What are the five legal requirements of the issuance of a preliminary injunction? I assume you should know that, but I don't assume you should know that. You should know that. I assume you know it. You got something for me? No adequate remedy at law. Ooh. Immediate irreparable injury. Immediate irreparable harm. Likelihood, Likelihood of success is two. Immediate irreparable harm, four. Balance the harms, fifth is public policy concerns. No adequate remedy at law. Likelihood of success on the merits. Aye, 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 immediate irreparable harm or injury. Balance the harms to the competing interests here. And five, what if any public policy considerations there are, right? No adequate remedy at law. Money damages won't make the plaintiff whole. Likelihood of success on the merits. Who's likely to succeed on the merits of this case? The more likely you are to succeed, the more likely you should get what you're seeking. Immediate irreparable injury. When we're talking about a TRO or preliminary injunction, if you want to get an order during the pendency of the case, you've got to show some immediacy of that injury such that you will be harmed during the pendency of this case. Uh, the balance of harm should tip in the favor of the party seeking the injunction but there will be competing harms to the party against whom the injunction is granted. And then last, what if any public policy considerations are at stake here? Um, temporary, preliminary, and permanent injunctions differ in. They should be able to get this by process of elimination. Because uh, there's a legitimate reason for you to disagree on one of them. But first of all, do they disagree in duration? How long they're good for? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. So that's a correct answer. Let me skip to C. Do they dis, dis, uh, are they did they differ in the time of imposition when they are imposed? Yeah. yeah. So that's a correct that's answer. What I did. So then we got to go to D, right? Because D is the only one that says all of the above, and we know at least two of them are correct answers. And the reason why, and this is this is important to me. Um, they say it's B as well, and that's fair, but I want to explain why, because I always give you the same five-part test, whether it's a TRO, preliminary, permanent. Um, what they're saying here is on the likelihood of success, if it's a permanent injunction, you've already established that you've won the case, and so therefore the, you don't have to establish the likelihood of success because you've shown you've actually succeeded. So that is slightly different analysis for a permanent injunction as opposed to the other two. And they also say that the immediacy of the injury doesn't have to be as significant on a permanent injunction. And so that's fair as well. And uh, no matter of law, likelihood of success in the merits, uh, the immediate irreparable injury, the balance of harms, uh, the competing harms, and then five, public policy, that the, the, those can vary depending on whether it's sought as a matter of a no notice under a TRO, preliminary injunction, which is going to mean that you've got to show the you need this, you need this for the duration of the case in order to uh, prevent further injury. So I think they, 
I, I am not as crazy about putting B in there. I can't understand why they're saying the analysis for the five parts <coughs> is a little different depending on when you're seeking it. But I would prefer that you continue, and I think it's more appropriate, to continue to recognize that whether it's a TRO permanent, we're using for the most part that five-part test that you know, and that's what you should apply. Uh, even if, as you think about the permanent injunction, that there is some, um, at that point, you're going to have to have established that not just likelihood of success, but that you are, in fact, the winner. Um, 87, uh, Charlie's Chips, right? And what they say the correct answer is here is, well, what do you say is the correct answer for 87? I think C. C is in cat is what they say is the correct answer as well for Charlie's Chips. Um, and again, what we're looking at is preserving the status quo during the pendency of the uh, matter. You know, the fact is, is that D, deny the preliminary injunction which fails to advance the public interest. There isn't always a public interest in every injunctive relief case. Uh, a lot of times there, there is none. You know, we get two businesses suing each other, or we've got um, uh, a business suing an individual on a non-compete, which, by the way, uh, that was in the, the Globe a couple weeks ago. The governor is pushing legislation to limit um, the non-compete agreements in uh, various uh, technologies and businesses within Massachusetts is a means, as uh, he sees it, of encouraging greater innovation. Uh, but that area may change by statute relatively quickly, the way the article was talking about as to whether, to what extent, uh, mass, which has a tendency to disfavor covenants not to compete anyway, uh, to, to limit their enforcement even further, uh, which I don't think would be a bad thing, because I think if you talk about matters being overused, like some of these forum selection clauses, uh, non-competes are uh, significantly, in, in my experience, abused by companies. And, uh, and mass, they, they, are they pretty common? Yeah, they're a pretty common period now, again, because of the nature in which business can be conducted on a broad basis for geography, and to the extent that, at least before, maybe we competed in a relatively small area, we now compete virtually across the country. Someone could be out of work for a year or more as a result of the non-compete. Um, most of us don't have a safety net of a year's salary or a year's income. Uh, to be able to be staying out of our preferred line of work that probably likely paid us relatively lucratively if we, in fact, had a non-compete that we were that valuable to the company. Um, 88, the requirements of Rule 65. Um, you guys should remember those cases, the security cases, why the security is needed in order to compensate the enjoined party if the injunction is later found to be improvidently granted. But you remember while there has to be a bond, the amount of the bond is discretionary with the court. The court has huge amounts of discretion as to what it said. There were even some courts that said, since you have so much discretion, you don't have to establish one at all. The rule, though, 88, does in fact require one. <coughs> And although the amount rests with the discretion of the court, we understand that that's another basis for argument as to how much that bond should be. But that means you're going to have to establish that you will be damaged as a result of the uh, injunction being granted or not, uh, being, being granted and what your damage is likely will be. Did you uh, say that? I remember one of those cases that was like grounds for reversible error because they didn't Asked one, but I think you said it's not really anymore. Like, you know, no, uh, what I said is it varies from circuit to circuit. Um, there is some in, in mass, uh, we've got some a fair amount of case law that says that the bond should be set. New York, we had a jurisdiction that said, well, since it's since you can, uh, since the amount is discretionary, you don't have to set it. So you do see some variation with that, but frankly, you know, a lot of times in mass, the bond will be set at 50 bucks. So it's really not of any value to me, although there's a bond set. And that's the point, is if the court can set such a low amount, it might as well set no bond. Oftentimes the bond in mass will be set at a relatively modest amount. It's why you then, though, have to argue what your damages will be if the injunction is granted, because you're going to need to put in evidence into the record to show why you need a more substantial bond. 
Um, so that's the bond one. 79, your last one here. Um, Footworks is replicating one of its styles, violation of trademark. Shoes are scheduled to appear uh, in four days. Shoes files a complaint with a viable claim regarding the violation of its intellectual property. Which of the following injunctions should it seek? Uh, could it seek? Yeah. Yeah, I read that. Well, actually, yeah, they've actually. No, where is it? No, no, they've actually. They. What do you guys like? I'd say C. Yeah, actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna correct it and say C as well because I think what it means is seek right away, okay? But when you seek, when you file a complaint, you seek injunctive relief. Your complaint actually has to ask for each of what you ultimately want. So you would ask if you were going to get a, seek a TRO. You'd ask one of the prayers for relief would say get a TRO. The second one would be and then after a preliminary hearing provide preliminary injunctive relief. And then after a full hearing on the merits, provide the plaintiff permanent injunctive relief prohibiting the defendant from doing blah, 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 whatever it is. In your complaint, you would actually seek all three. And you would name all three because that's what then entitles you to move by motion at a later point to get it. So the right answer is C. They said, they said, uh, they said B, temporary and preliminary. But the, fra the fact is the way it's worded, if you're saying could it seek, when it files a complaint, it could and should seek all three, although obviously the timing of it will depend on when they move for it. They could seek the TRO or they could choose to forego the TRO, but they are likely going to seek a preliminary injunction. And then at some point, obviously, since they feel there's trademark violations, they want permanent injunctive relief as well. And that would be sought in the complaint, although later down the road they would formally bring, present that motion to the court but it has to be and should be described in the complaint as well as to what the permanent injunctive relief they're seeking is. Okay? Good. How likely is it that you would lose a, if you, if you went to get a, like a, a preliminary injunction and you were successful in the hearing and you were seeking a permanent that the court would deny it? The permanent? Yeah. It, it happens because, you know, the fact is situations change as well. And a lot of times on the early hearings when you're arguing a preliminary injunction, we could be arguing that within the first 30 days of the case. There's been no discovery. The person seeking the injunction had ample time to, to marshal their facts and their evidence in their case law. And, and the fact is, and we had one of the cases say it, it's only a preliminary finding of who's likely to win or lose. Absent discovery, and discovery in civil cases is going to consume a year or more time. You know, the fact is, is that at that point, we might have a different version of the facts, different witnesses come forward, or the court might just be inclined to think that what you described as the problem in this preliminary hearing, and, and again, remember the nature of the preliminary hearing. We had cases that said it doesn't need to be evidentiary necessarily. It could be taken on affidavits and the party's briefs. That's a lot different than an adversarial hearing where a witness is subject to cross and that witness may not stand up to cross, oftentimes won't stand up to cross because, again, the affidavits were written by the attorneys, the requests for injunctive relief were written by attorneys, the memos written by attorneys. Let's see if the witnesses will say what they said they were going to say. They almost never stand up completely because no, no witness can stand up completely to, to a vigorous cross because you know where the holes are. And especially something that happens within the first 30 days of the case could be dramatically different 18 months later after an opportunity for discovery and documents and everything else. Um, and so, so it's, it, it can happen, although obviously winning at the preliminary injunction stage, that, that might obviate the necessity for any proceedings going forward, depending on what, it, what, what the order you receive is, because that could change who's got the high ground and how long you get to hold it for. It may mean that the other side has to think more seriously about resolving the case. And so you want to win when you can, but sometimes you got to take the longer view and expect that I'm going to win at the, at the permanent injunction stage. Um, I'm not likely to be able to show my success here. It, it could well be that the harm that the defendant, or that the moving party, the plaintiff is showing is so significant that the court has to do something. But if they don't have a claim that at the end of the day is going to survive the legal challenge, they've got to show liability as well and that the law supports what they want, 
then no matter how great the harm is, they shouldn't win it at the trial at the on the ultimate case. Okay, good.